Congratulations. You've made it to the end of Friday. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. I am here to shepherd you into the weekend on the BWI Daily Edition, and I'm going to be joined by our recruiting insider and our resident sharp to give you what you want this weekend. Fun, winning, and all the stuff that comes with it. That's coming up on the BWI Daily Edition. Welcome to the happy hour edition. It's a dry happy hour edition because uh, I drank all my uh, beers last night during the Thursday night football game. I'm Thomas Reichard. That's Ryan Snyder. Ryan, how are you doing today? No alcohol for me this week. I had a minor surgery, so uh, got some pain pills. You know what I mean? So it shouldn't be mixing them up. So we, we got another couple of days uh, before wife and I have a couple of drinks in this house. Although I don't know how I'm going to make it Saturday night, done working. Might have to have one or two, but <laughs> that's also one of those situations. It's a three thirty kick. I'm like, yeah, okay, three thirty middle of the day. That's fine. Like you'll be done working at ten thirty. Go to bed. <laughs> that's the other yeah, way around probably. that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it's a, it's gonna be a fun weekend. There's gonna be a lot of great stuff going on. We're gonna do a quick review of the week in Penn State football recruiting. Get to the best bets and get you some information about Penn State football and Northwestern coming up this weekend. First thing, Ryan, um, and this is kind of a news and notes section of the last couple of days, Penn State's handed out some new offers. So what do we need to know on that front? Yeah, so pretty much just the uh, main thing I would say, too, there's two offers. That One was a 2026 offer. <laughs> so uh, to a kid in Georgia, I mean, I'm sure it'll be a great player, but obviously that's way down the road, right? Let's just get to the ones that are 2024. Uh, two guys that grabbed my attention, DJ Tolliver. Uh, offensive tackle prospect out of uh, Lord Bortcourt. I, I have no idea how to say this school's name. I've always struggled with this school. Lord Bortcourt. I have no idea. But out <laughs> of Daleville, Virginia, to, it's not as fun to say Shamanam Madonna, which I have been Shaman like singing my yes. <laughs> Every time you say it, I smile. So can you say it one more time? <laughs> Shamanam Madonna. Yeah, it took okay. me a couple years to figure that one out. But uh, anyway, so uh, new new offensive tackle offer, three star prospect. Uh, some quality offers, Virginia Tech. North Carolina, Duke, uh, Penn State now is, I believe, the fifth school to to offer DJ. Uh, some solid looking film coming out, but I mean, like all these 2024 guys, it's, it's you know get it get the offer out, get a foot in the door, see how he progresses, get him on campus. There's a lot of steps here that that still have to happen before uh, all of a sudden we're talking about DJ Tolliver the same way we were talking about Evan Link or, or guys mm -hmm. like that uh, for the 2023 class. But certainly somebody to keep an eye on. Uh, Jordan Marshall is another one, a 2024 running back out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Archbishop Moeller, that, that school I can pronounce at least. Uh, Four-star prospect, uh, ranked number 108 in the country by 0-3 right now. Jordan has a deep offer list. He has Ohio State. Of course, he's the Ohio guy, right? So I think I, instantly everybody thinks the Buckeyes there. Uh, he has visited Tennessee a few times, though, so Tennessee's ranks pretty high in the 0-3 uh, recruiting prediction machine. There's other schools. Michigan's in the mix. Iowa, um, I think Louisville, Kentucky, or a couple others. Um, I think Purdue's another one that, that grabbed my attention. But uh, certainly another player that uh, – Penn State will want to get on campus at some point. I mean, that, that 2024 running back class, uh, there, there's a good crop there. And depending on how this class shakes out, like Penn State definitely, we've talked about this in recent weeks, Penn State definitely would like to, to get another 2023 running back if they can, mm -hmm. obviously with uh, London Montgomery's injury and, and you know, just the simple fact of what, what we've seen with the freshman taking over and what, what the, the, the transfer portal could mean for that room down the road. Uh, they definitely would like to get another running back in this class. But if they can't, that 2024 class has has some quality talent there, and uh, I think it's shaping up to potentially be a, a two two running back class like we saw last year with Singleton and Allen. So uh, a lot of quality there. Like I said, in that 2024 class, De Dewan Williams is another one we, we've talked about him. Jordan Lyle, another one out of St. Thomas Aquinas, and Sam Williams Dixon as well. Uh, he's another Ohio prospect who camped at Penn State. So those three kind of grab my attention, and uh, you know, let's see what happens here with uh, Jordan here, Jordan Marshall moving forward. So those are the new offers, but uh, those are not the most imminent things happening for Penn State football this week, and especially this weekend. You've been hard at work confirming who's coming to the Northwestern game, all the way back to the early look that we had it uh, at it uh, on Tuesday on the recruiting show. Mm -hmm. Now we're a day out, uh, or the day of, if you're listening to the podcast here on Saturday morning. So 
Who are the players that you want to highlight that you've been able to contact, you've been able to confirm over the last couple of days that are going to be at the game? Like you mentioned before, 330 kick works out to be a little bit better for some players getting to Happy Valley. So what do we got? Yeah, Hurricane Remnants, though, do not work out very well for that. So let's no. see how that shakes out. Uh, you know, the way the weather's looking, like it looks like it actually, I mean, I'm not a weather guy, but it looks like it might not rain too much in State College. It looks like it's kind of going to stay east. It's, But still, the, the, the simple fact that Everybody coming to the game is going to be coming from Virginia, Maryland, New Jersey, and they got to drive through all of that. It does matter, and it, and it does impact the list, and it will impact this list. I mean, right now we're looking at about nine uncommitted guys who have a scholarship offer. We're looking at about a little under 20 or so guys who will play Division One football, whether it's at Penn State or Leicester School. Uh, and that's a good list for, for a game like this. Uh, but like I said, I mean, if – if four or five, six of those guys don't drop off, if, if the weather is you know raining really hard Saturday morning throughout the region, uh, I'd be surprised. And that's just from looking looking over the years and, and seeing how much that impacts that. I mean, you Penn State fans are diehard, but I know there's going to be some of you probably that are like, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to drive through this uh, to watch the Northwestern game this weekend, right? So yeah. let's, see, let's see how it shakes out. But I, I will run into a couple guys here real quick. Rodney Lohr is a player we've been talking about a good bit here. Uh, over the past week or so, uh, 2023 defensive lineman out of Woodbury Forest in Virginia. Uh, you know, Penn State saw Rodney play last week. Uh, I think they have interest. I don't think they're going to maybe offer immediately. I think he's a situation where kind of see how he progresses. The the big the impression I get is they re they'd really like to see um, you know from a size perspective what he checks in at right now. We have six four right. two seventy. I, I think. You know, they, they've seen him in person. They've been talking to him, getting him on campus for this. One of the biggest things they'll get away, they'll get out of this is, is weighing him and getting an accurate height, getting an accurate weight, uh, just to kind of get a feel for where he's actually at at the moment. So that, that'll be something I'll be curious to look at. Uh, I was digging uh, a little bit on Rodney this week and, and getting a feel for other schools. Of course, he decommitted from Virginia uh, this time last week. It sounds like Michigan's serious here. Michigan offered mm -hmm. him in March. They kind of cooled, which, you know, we see that all the time. Schools offer, they kind of look elsewhere, then they circle back. Uh, Michigan is certainly circling back here at the moment. If I had to, to pick between Penn State and Michigan as who seems more serious at the moment, I, I would probably lean towards towards Michigan. So uh, now with that said, he might come up this weekend, visit goes great, you know, checks in well, and uh, they, they get more time to, to talk and get to know his family and, and things could change. Uh, but right now I get the, the impression that Penn State has interest, you know, that they're going to keep monitoring him. But I don't know if uh, I would say an offer is imminent on Saturday. But of course, they don't have say, it'll probably happen. But, they don't have any testing data and they don't have any numbers. Right. So that's no. a, a big part of this. Correct. Yeah. So that that's that's really, I think, what they want to get out of this weekend, yeah. of course. And, you know, again, getting guys on campus, when you get them on campus, you can talk all you want. You can, you know, the, sit down, whether it's before the game, after the game, that'll be important, too. Um, yeah. But I just. I just think this one's going to just going to drag out a little bit because let's also just remember the defensive end is still more of a priority than defensive tackle. And he would definitely be a defensive tackle. So yeah. just, you know, they're, they're going to keep, they're going to keep their eyes out for a bunch of guys. And he's certainly going to be one of the, one of the players we're monitoring. Big guy with quickness, always fun to watch, but uh, guys with quickness in general are always fun to watch. Who else is on the list and, and who are you keeping your eye on this weekend? And anybody that uh, you can land my segue with. <laughs> <laughs> Rico Scott, I guess, would be the best one. I don't know. I mean, there's a couple. I mean, Bobby Torrey is a, a pretty good player uh, out of uh, Irvington in New Jersey. Uh, I mean, Torre is, is going to be the highest ranked guy on campus this weekend. I, I don't know his 40 numbers off him, but I, I think he's a pretty – Pretty fast player from what I've seen. Uh, we haven't on three has him at number fifty eight in the nation right now. Number five at safety. Number one in the state of New Jersey. Uh, Torrey's family though is very Rutgers heavy. His brother Muhammad plays for them now. Uh, his his middle brother too is is committed in the twenty twenty three class. So obviously there's some strong ties to Rutgers. Uh, whether that impacts him a whole lot down the road, we'll, we'll see. I mean, uh, he's he certainly uh, has more opportunities than his brother. Uh, but both of his brothers, excuse me. Uh, mm -hmm. But Cincinnati, Illinois, Kentucky, Notre Dame, Ohio State, and Pitt are a few other schools that Torrey has visited so far. Penn State hosted him for a visit back in June 2021. So it was like right when the uh, pandemic dead period ended and, and visits mm -hmm. started. So he hasn't been on campus for, I don't know, whatever that is. Is that 16, 17 months now? Something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it'll be good to get him back on campus. But uh, let's, 
Uh, one, let's see if he makes it because, again, I think the weather is going to have an impact on this list. And then two, uh, like all these 2024 guys, they're, they'll keep evaluating and uh, see where they're at at the end. Now, what I would say, though, is uh, Torre, out of the guys they're evaluating, he makes the most sense right now or for the most part out of this list on guys that they're going to be pretty serious about. Yeah. But Looks like uh, a linebacker couple- to me. Just just a quick aside, looks like a linebacker because uh, just the highlights there, they're all in underneath coverage. And he seems like a guy that uh, despite six one, I think is what he's listed at really mm-hmm. good frame. So just in, in a Manny Diaz system and if they're still recruiting to that system, you know, which they are that I'm always curious. Is it a safety? Mm-hmm. Is it a line? Is, is it that striker Sam linebacker? So that's just kind of off the off the cuff. What I was thinking about that. Uh, the other guys you're talking about here. Sorry to keep right. cutting you off. You're good. I cut you off all the time. So you're, you're good on that. I mean, the one thing I would say too is like, just like Rodney Laura, like his height and weight, because he hasn't been here in 16 yep. months, like that's going to be a number that Penn State really wants to wants to figure out. So, um, but yeah, just a couple other guys I, I'll I mention offhand. Uh, Nair Daniels, uh, Sean and I talked about him on the Tuesday podcast. I said 6'2", 350 on the Tuesday. He was 6'7", uh, 350, I think is, is what I said. I, I, I don't know. I mixed it all up. But he's 6'7", 350. Uh, massive, massive offensive tackle prospect. Uh, he's visited Syracuse before. This will be his third visit to Penn State. Uh, another guy that just let's see how things play out here. But they want to keep getting – uh, bigger on the offensive line. And, and where I'm going with that is there's another top 2024 20, offensive lineman coming to visit in Juan Manaya. He's 6'6", 315. Uh, both Daniels and Manaya are from New Jersey. Uh, switching to Manaya here. I mean, he, he's taken, I think, one trip to Michigan State, and this would be his second trip uh, to Penn State. So he hasn't been too, too active yet. But uh, another another quality-looking prospect that uh, I think between these guys and Kevin Haywood and uh, the Armstrong twins and uh, a couple others. You know, there's the other kid, uh, Ben Roebuck. I'm not thinking of um, St. Edwards. I mean, there, there are some quality uh, offensive tackle, offensive line prospects that uh, Penn State seems to have a good foot in the door with. And, you know, obviously they want to see how these guys keep progressing from a size perspective and on the field. And once we get to January, February, we'll really have a good sense for that, for that room and, and that board. A uh, couple others, Jalen Harvey, quality prospect out of Quincy Orchard. Keep an eye on him. This will be his third visit to Penn State if he makes it up. Good-looking defensive end, four-star prospect. Uh, another one, Eric Lee out of IMG, originally from Camden, uh, New Jersey. He's down at IMG now. IMG has a bye week this week. I think even if IMG didn't have a bye week, he'd probably be home after after that hurricane came through, yeah. uh, you know, western uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida this week. So he's home for the weekend. Um, I haven't seen too much film from Eric. I'm not sure how much he's playing at IMG right now. That's trying something I'm trying to figure out because uh, I haven't seen really a whole lot of film from him. And, and he made a late transfer to IMG too. Like he, I think he figured it out in like mid July and was there like three, four weeks later. Uh, so he made a late decision to get down there. So I, I would like to learn more about Eric's progress at IMG. Uh, but uh, certainly a, a good looking prospect out of the mid Atlantic region. Uh, One more I have to mention then, too, is Rico Scott, of course, the Bishop McDevitt wide receiver who uh, we've talked about quite a bit uh, in in recent months here. I mean, Rico has been on campus, I don't know, four times now. I think this will be his fourth visit, maybe his fifth. It's one of those two. Um, He's also been, you know, Rico's been going to Texas A&M quite a bit, too. He's taken two visits to A&M and he has another set for October. So I think it's pretty clear that he has a lot of interest in the Aggies. Uh, Rico's also been to Alabama, Baylor and Texas. And he has recent offers from Auburn and South Carolina uh, just this month. So quality, you know, quality list of guys. I think it's for Northwestern. It's it's, it's about as good as you could really ask for. And then especially considering your next two home games are the whiteout and Ohio State. Right. Um, and, you know, and a lot of these guys visiting are going to want to come back for those games in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think it I think it's a pretty good list. But again, talk to me Sunday and, and let's see where it shakes out. And the weather's going to have a big impact on it. So a good list of visitors for the weekend. And of course, if you want to check out more information about that, we'll have post game recap, stuff like that. Uh, Greg Pickle, Sean Fitz, Ryan Snyder, all going to be digging into that during the game. Who's there? Kind of some photos. And this is a great time, by the way, to check out bluewhiteillustrated.com on the Lions End message form. So you can get all that information during the game and you can see for yourself, who's there and and who our experts are tracking. It is $1 to sign up as of me saying this. I don't know when that's going to end, but right now, if you're watching on Friday, it's a dollar to sign up. 
and you get 12 months of access. So do that. While I'm at it and I'm giving you my stump speech, please like the video. It always helps us out. Uh, we've been getting consistently to the 500 mark that we set for these videos. So keep us keep us there. I, I, I just implore you for that. And if you're listening on the podcast version, thank you. Um, our podcast numbers are exploding. Please be a part of the movement. Subscribe to the Blue White Illustrated podcast. Download it and uh, all the notifications. And if you want to be like super in-depth with the podcast, Watch the YouTube video, then listen to it. You know, you can never get too much of Ryan <laughs> Snyder. I'm not Speaking even that hardcore. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, contractually, I have to be, but uh, I don't <laughs> I gotcha. always get there myself. Uh, let's. Speaking of too much Ryan Snyder, and there's never such a thing, let's get to Ryan Snyder's best bets. I think this is going to be one of the best seasons Toledo's ever had. Uh, we'll do the official play. will be minus seven and a half first half. Degenerate in me sometimes watches a little Hawaii, you know. Uh, Stanford, I'll, I'll, I'll lay 12 with Stanford. Vanderbilt stinks. I had them last week against Notre Dame. That was a winner. It never gets old. Yachts and, <laughs> and private planes and then burning money. Never I, get I, ha Frank. <laughs> I have to contain how proud of myself I am. And I know that I haven't, but I have to contain As you're myself dancing to it. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's look at the list this week. Uh, we got four games on tap and uh, we'll mm -hmm. get to here. Washington at UCLA, Iowa State at Kansas, uh, East Carolina at South Florida, Northwestern at Penn State, which, of course, is the game of the week. So take us through the list. Let's start with Washington three and a half at UCLA. Yes, and let's skip over the fact that I was one and four last week. Uh, not a great week for for me. Uh, we're four and six on the season, and I'll keep pointing to forty five and thirty four all time. Right, that's not a bad yeah. number. But uh, yeah. last week wasn't my best best of weeks. Old Dominion crushed me, and I'm really really kicking myself because I had Kansas State in the picks originally, and then I took them out to put in Old Dominion because I was like, oh, Ricky Ronnie ties. Maybe fans will like this. And of course, you know, that, 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 with your that heart. didn't work too well. Betting with yeah, your heart. Yeah, didn't, didn't work out too well. So time for a bounce back, though. Let's let's get to uh, let's get to three and one this week. That's the goal. Uh, tonight, Washington State at UCL, or excuse me, Washington at UCLA tonight. Uh, that's a Friday night game. So uh, if you're watching this Saturday, hopefully, uh, hopefully this ends up being a winner, <laughs> whatever you're watching, all these guys. But but I, I like I like Washington, or excuse me, I like UCLA getting the three and a half points tonight. I, Washington has only beaten Michigan State so far. I just I don't I think I think they're a good team. Don't get me wrong. I just think the the stock and the, the hype around Washington is kind of um, you know just gotten a little higher than it needs to be. I mean they're already up to number fifteen in the polls, and like I said, they've just beaten nobody. Uh, if you if you watched us last year, T Frank, I don't know if you remember. I was betting Dorian Thompson Robinson and UCLA yeah. all the time last year, yep. so we're gonna we're gonna keep that going. Um, Washington secondary is is not. I don't think they're that great. I mean, they're they're seventieth and they're in the seventies right now and allowing big time throws. I think that sets up well for Thompson Robinson. Um, you know, and and really, Washington hasn't been on the road. I don't believe at all this year. I think this is their first road game. They're playing the best quarterback they've faced all season. Uh, UCLA's defense isn't too bad either, man. They're they're top twenty five in the nation right now in uh in the in sacks i think they have 11 or 12 on the year so far so they're getting after it uh I, i've just i've been on ucla for two years now as far as a team that i think is just kind of you get good you get good odds with because they're not you know they're not in that oregon usc bracket but they're they're still a quality team uh for pac-12 standards at least and uh, I, I just like them at home tonight getting points uh, i'll take a i'll take a a home underdog uh, every chance i can get and um, 10 30 tonight too so when you're coming back late night from the bars got nothing to do let's let's throw a little money uh, on ucla uh the degenerate in you is watching uh pack 12 after dark on a friday night before a big penn state game i love it yes uh iowa state at kansas kansas four and oh right at, at this point so uh what mm -hmm. are you looking at here on this at this game yeah, I think the Kansas love is gonna is gonna come to an end this weekend. Uh, I, I, you know, they everybody's been wanting Kansas to be ranked in the top twenty five. I think you're gonna see why uh, they they're not a top twenty five team on Saturday. Uh, look, Iowa State has some has some close wins, some close losses this year. 
Uh, but I think this just sets up well for Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell's really good in these spots uh, over the years. Um, excuse me, as a, I saw this stat earlier today, as a underdog of three or favorite of three. So in these close games, you know, where it's yeah. six point swing, either way over, um, you know, a favorite of three or underdog of three, Matt Campbell is 34 and 18 against the spread all time. It's really good. Yeah. And again, the big 12, he's 26 and 12 uh, in these situations. So uh, I, I try not to look at numbers too much. But I mean, but Matt Campbell has been just been consistently doing yeah. this as well, and 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 Iowa State's been very good team in October. Of course, he doesn't have uh, you know all the pieces that they had in recent years. Now they they've lost a, a few key players from last year's team, but I, I still think Iowa State's a quality program. You, you know what the score of this game was last year, T. Frank? It was yeah. Iowa State fifty eight to seven. Okay, I mean <laughs> they they just romped Kansas last year. Yes, yeah. Kansas is a better team now, but they've played nobody. I mean Duke's. You know, yeah, Duke was undefeated, but their big win was over Northwestern. I mean, it's just yeah, we'll get to that. In a you're bit. getting, a, yeah, you're getting a situation yeah. here where, uh, and and I like that. I mean, the public is playing Kansas pretty hard this weekend. I mean, like there's a lot of money coming in on Kansas, so I'm mm -hmm. always about you know going against uh, what what the popular money does, taking the other side because that's that's usually how the casinos win their money. So I, I like to try and pretend I'm. I'm on the casino side sometimes. So anyway, just give me Iowa State minus three in this one. I, I feel pretty good about it. I think the love for the Jayhawks is going to come to an end. Do you see that as a coaching stat, by the way, in those three-point swing games, which basically means it's a close game, and Matt Campbell has such a good record in those. Do you see that as a coaching advantage? Can you kind of directly correlate those in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I, I think he also had just great leadership on his teams over the years, too. I mean, that that those last two, three years of Iowa State, man, were, you know, generational kind of teams for for that program, yeah. too. And, you know, a lot of quality players came out of came out of that program are now in the NFL, of course. So but yeah, I mean, you have to give you have to give Campbell and the staff a lot of credit. They make the right moves when it matters most in, in these tight games. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of things, man. Luck gets into it, too. I mean, yeah. You, yeah. You can, for every five games I could point to coaching and leadership, you someone else could point out five more where they just got lucky in this situation, yeah. right? There's so, a fumble that shouldn't have happened or an unfair. Right. 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 So, I mean, it's – it's I can't pretend I've watched Iowa State uh, closely enough to to really know all the answers there. But, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that – those last couple of years, man, they had great leadership. And, and when they got down in games, man, they really rallied in quite a few of them. So our next game uh, is East Carolina at South Florida. We have a directional game, so I know mm -hmm. nothing about it. I have absolutely no insight into this. So what do you got for East Carolina and South Florida? Yeah, so I, I just I just think East Carolina is a way better team than South Florida. And I think it's going to be very evident in this game. Uh, look, ECU's had a tough schedule so far. Uh, they, I think they lost to NC State by one point. And I think they lost to Louisville. I want to say, or no, excuse me, Navy by like two or three. Like, I mean, both. I mean, Navy's always hard because it's you know you have that option. It's hard to prepare yep. for NC State. You know, we're we're gonna get a good look at them this weekend against Clemson. So I, I just I, I think ECU is a better program than what their record shows. I think they're two and two at the moment. Uh, but I mean, here's what really stands out to me is USF allowed 542 yards against Louisville. They allowed 573 yards against BYU. I mean, their 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 defense Yee. is not very good. I yeah. think ECU's quarterback Holton Ayers is is a quality player. Nothing special or anything, but he's he's he makes pretty smart decisions, completing 68 percent of his passes so far. I like Keaton Mitchell too. ECU's running back, averaging 8.4 yards per carry. So I think they can. They can consistently get yards in this game and, and you know get get those tough yards when they need it. So I, I just I just think at the end of the day, man, ECU is a way better program than South Florida. You know, you add in the fact that South Florida is really from Tampa and they're not from South Florida, and you know everything that disrupted uh, yeah. uh, South Florida this week. I mean, they're playing this game. What's funny is they're actually playing this game in South Florida in Boca Raton now. Uh, even though Tampa's not really, uh, you know, where what the schools call South Florida, but it's not really in South Florida. I never knew. But that. this week they're actually they're actually playing in South Florida, which <laughs> is in Boca Raton. So, uh, but you know, it's a neutral site game, basically. You know, that just USF's schedule has been all out of whack this week. I don't know how committed they are to this, but and you know, yeah. one other thing too, I'd say is you know, ECU they lost they lost against NC State and Navy, but they outgained them in both games. I mean, if you go back. I remember watching watching the NC State game pretty closely that first week. I mean, ECU absolutely could have beaten NC State that first week. Yeah. So, 
Um, you know, I just think they're a quality team. I think USF, USS haven't, hasn't been a great team for quite a few years. They played Florida okay in a game, and I think that's why this spread is not like 14, but I think Florida stinks, and I think Florida just didn't come to play that day either. And um, Long story short, give, just give me ECU minus eight. I was really hoping to get this at seven or seven and a half, but it looks like it's going to go the opposite way to more so eight and a half or nine. So get it in now if you want it. Uh, give me, uh, yeah, give me the Pirates minus eight. All right, so that leads us to our game of the week, Northwestern at Penn State, Northwestern and Central Michigan. Not only do they have a common opponent, they almost have a common line here, Mm -hmm. uh, 25 and a half points. So what are you doing in this game? Yeah, so I suck at picking Penn State games, guys, if you haven't realized that yet. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The curse of knowledge, you know too much. Yeah, I was wrong with Auburn. Uh, I mean, I was right because I picked Penn State in our predictions, but then I went with the over-under. Of course, I went with the under, it went over. And then last week, I picked Penn State uh, and Central Michigan covered. I, you know, there, there's part of me that really thinks we're going to see a pretty similar game to last week. Uh, and there, there's and, and it's just this whole dynamic of Penn State playing up and down to its competition. Like, they've, they've mm-hmm. done this for a long time. And, you know, that, that makes me want to pick Northwestern. But, like, I can't pick Northwestern here, guys. <laughs> like, there's no way yeah. I can pick – Northwestern to cover this, uh, but I mean, I of course I bet one of my one of my best bets last week was Northwestern uh, minus seven versus Miami Ohio. I was like, dude, you know they've lost two in a row. They're coming off a loss to Southern Illinois. Miami Ohio has a backup quarterback. Like all these things were pointing towards Northwestern, and then they freaking lost. You know, they, yeah. they didn't just not cover; they lost. So yeah. I I just don't know how you could pick Northwestern in this one. Uh, I will have to take Penn State minus twenty five, but you know you just. I don't feel very confident about it. I mean, there was part of me that liked the over because I feel like Penn State can put up some serious points here. But then yeah. you have the whole dynamic of how much will the backups play and Franklin's pounding the table about depth. and yeah. There's all types of things here that make this one a difficult one to pick. I, I'll, I'll go Penn State, but I don't feel very confident one way or the other. Um, T. Frank, I, I mean, I, I let me ask you a couple of questions, actually, T. Frank, before, sure. before we get in this. Sure. Um, Northwestern's run game, you've watched this a little bit more than I have just kind of what are you what are you seeing from their run game right now because I just watching that Miami game last week uh, I just saw some mixed things what have you seen yeah and that's kind of the problem is that there's a little bit of a correlation to Penn State last year where they do one thing really well and that's run between the tackles but when you can just play good defense play sound run defense Peter Skaronsky can create some big holes but not every play, right? And mm-hmm. uh, the, an offensive line that is good and works well together is not five all-stars. It's one or two really good players, maybe some specific skills. And then outside of that, it, it's just college offensive linemen. So Miami of Ohio played really good run defense and they uh, limited Evan Hall to 3.1 yards per carry because mm-hmm. Northwestern inside zone, man, that's what they do. Outside of that, the tight ends aren't great run blockers. They're not great blockers on the perimeter. Uh, I think they're okay at pulling, but in general, the offense has not been able to operate in any part of the field except for that, you know, six-yard box. And that's not how you have a healthy run game, especially if absolutely no one respects your passing game, which is the reality with Northwestern. Right. Well, I mean, they are throwing it a little bit more. I mean, Helinski, I think he has like 1,200 yards passing now. Like, they're... Yeah. They're throwing it more now, I believe. Like, is that kind of like what what you've seen? It looks like they, yeah. At least, I mean, just from outside looking in. Because I mean, last week they had like two hundred and I don't know, like two hundred fifty seven yards passing versus Miami High, which is more than I expected them to have. Like, I, I kind of expected them to run the ball more, but they couldn't, as as you kind of mentioned. I mean, they averaged like what you said, three point one yards per carry it was pretty pretty trashy. But uh, what what have you yeah. seen? I guess just from their from their passing offense. Uh, so it, it's been a bad game script for them so far this year because the opening game against Nebraska I think you saw the identity of what they want to be which is they want to be able to run the football and then create play action situations create easy throws for for Helinski I mean the 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 comparisons to Sean Clifford are are clear but Helinski's a worse quarterback um and and the problem has been and really, I'm going to cite the Duke game and the Miami of Ohio game as kind of the, the competition that had two different plans of attack. One was run heavy with Miami of Ohio. The other one was spread pass attack with Duke, uh, even though they're, they were able to run the ball, too. Um, this group uh, with the with the offense, if they get down, 
they don't have a recourse of how to play. They have no team speed, and it's Evan Hall and Cam Porter, and that's it. So if they mm-hmm. get down and they got down big against Duke, they have to throw the football. The opening game against Nebraska, they were able to run the ball effectively. And I think on one of the, the drives in the fourth quarter, they ran it every single play and got a <laughs> touchdown. Can you imagine them doing that at Beaver Stadium against no. Penn State? I can't. I can't imagine that. So this this group of this group on offense does not fit together because they need one thing to happen and you can stop that thing pretty reliably, I think. So then they're forced to throw the football and they want to throw the short passing game. Uh, and Helinski can make some big plays. He can throw off his back foot. He can throw with pressure in his face. Um, but he's so erratic. His accuracy is just terrible. Um, I, I made this comparison because I'm a Bills fan. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've seen before is like, if you've watched Josh Allen and his before and after of how he throws the football, that whole thing about his his mechanics transformation and why he's a good quarterback now. Ryan Helinski is the before picture, except he has none of those tools. So you've got a guy that throws with power leakage. He throws with these weird arm angles. It's very baseball-y. He's a linear thrower. None of it's good. And so Duke didn't respect their team speed and was jumping passes. And that's Duke. And not to say that there's anything wrong with Duke, but like they're not the same level as PB University, as Penn State's uh, secondary this year. So I've been predicting all week that Penn State's going to get a pick six here because Helinski going to be under pressure. This offensive line, when you force them to pass block in true passing situations, you get them off schedule. Skaronsky's one dude. The rest of the, especially the right side, I think Chop Robinson is going to feast on on that right side. Penn State's going to get pressure. The ball's going to come out weird. Helinski's going to see phantom pressures even when he's not getting pressured. All these things lead to a a, just a critical breakdown in their offense. They can move the ball with some short passing. Penn State might be susceptible to that. But more times than not, they're going to be in third and five or longer. And and that's where Penn State's going to shine in this game, weather permitting. You know, that again is the whole wild card here is what's the weather going to be like? Because that kind of leads into what Penn State can do offensively. So here's my other thing for you. I got one more question. They allowed 355 yards passing from Nebraska. Like that, yeah. that grabs my attention. And then what was it? I think there was, I think 461 yards overall was Duke. And that was, I yeah. think, was a pretty even. Balance. I think it was like I'm, I'm trying to look it up here. Like 240, yeah, 240 passing, 221 rushing. Yeah, uh, and then you know Southern Illinois. Like, I mean, okay, yeah, they outgained them 380 to 357. But I mean, Jesus, Southern Illinois even threw 261 on. Them. So like, what yeah. do you? What have you seen then from their defensive backs? I mean, they looks like they're allowing a lot of big plays. That kind of yeah. has my attention. I assume you see something similar. It's it's an interesting scheme, and that's the thing that I, that I've been. I watched it on you know on on film, and I'm like, why the hell? is there not a safety in the middle of the field? Like, basic defenses don't let people up the middle, whether it's the running game or the passing game. And it took, like, I was watching this this group play, and they look like they're always in man coverage. And what it is, is I I think, and I've kind of confirmed this through some observations of my own and some other places and some other sources, that it's a cover four system. It's, It's a match zone where your secondary is responsible for a guy, you know, number one, number two, number three, in the passing formation from outside in. And what they do is they match the secondary to the receivers, and then the underneath coverage is underneath coverage. So the linebacker safety, number 24, despite the fact that he's 5'11", 100 and 200 pounds maybe, uh, he's listed as a safety. He's completely an underneath coverage guy. And they run this match zone system that at times, if you spread them out, and this is what Duke did, and this is what I saw against Miami of Ohio, there's no one in the middle of the field because the safeties are playing over top of their defenders or or, of their receivers. And I just think that, you know, given the fact that they're in single coverage in the secondary and it's off coverage, but it's single coverage, whether it's to the boundary and you get that guy one-on-one or your, your deep crossers over the middle. I just think there's so much room for big plays for Penn State through the passing game. The biggest question is, can they get one early? If they can get one early, then the game is over because of what we talked about with Northwestern and their offense, that 
this group, Penn State needs to score uh, 14 points in the first quarter again. They need to put up 21 in the first half, and then the game is over. But Sean Clifford's 2 of 15 on deep passes. So is this going to line up poorly for Penn State, or is this the week that it's finally going to break out and they're going to get guys open in the secondary running free? And that's, Mm -hmm. to me, that's the matchup here. Mm-hmm. Okay. 200. I had one other stat I've noticed 216 yeah. yards. They allowed 216 yards rushing against Miami of Ohio last week and 221 yards rushing against Duke. So, yeah. I mean, I watched that Miami Ohio game. Like I said, I would, I don't know, begrudgingly bet, betting on Northwestern. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I was thinking last week, but like, I mean, Duke ran average 6.3 yards per carry against them. Yeah. Miami of Ohio averaged five yards per carry against them. I mean, this, I mean, Nick Singleton, Cape Tron Allen should have themselves a day here. I mean, even if, yeah. it, you know, whatever happens with Clifford Allen, whatever, what doesn't, I don't know if it's going to matter. I mean, like I've, Penn State should be able to control the ground game in this one, right? This is the, this is the saving grace, I think, for the Penn State offense, given what we just talked about with the passing game, because it does start up front in this game of um, kind of like the offense. They're very good going downhill. 240 pound linebacker, 235 pound linebacker. Uh, I think it's Bryce Gallagher. Uh, old school thumper, right? But this is the this is the cautionary tale to Penn State fans that want neck rolls and they want guys that are that old school thing. Is you've got old school problems. These guys are not fast, so just make them run, and that's it. And that's really however you can make these guys over pursue and then cut back or beat them to the point of attack. You you can do those things. So running up the middle, and this is kind of this is kind of an interesting thing is. Uh, Miami of Ohio did a great job of whenever they would gap exchange, whenever the Northwestern front would gap exchange on an inside zone where you're trying to run a stunt on the front side to get a free rusher into the, into the point of attack, they just wash that guy down because he's not athletic enough to hit the point. But if they just stay in their gaps, they're good. So Penn State, to me, this is where counter and uh, their sweep game and getting Singleton on the edge of the, of the formation as long as they're not running into that safety that's creeping down into the box, as long as they're not running into what Northwestern is trying to force them into and they're getting everybody to run sideline to sideline, there's going to be seams all day. Catron Allen and Nick Singleton and Kevon Leaf, he's back. He showed against Auburn on the play. I think he got hurt that he has that ability now when guys overset, he can cut back and he can get some big yardage. The other thing was just any, anytime you can get an athlete in space and that includes Sean Clifford, the running game should be there. And I think that there's a lot of different ways you can attack this unit. The one I would I would not do is run straight at them. Anything mm-hmm. else I think you should have. And that's where I think with Singleton is able to bounce to the outside. I would avoid condensed formations and kind of throwing yourself into the strength of this formation this week. That would be what I would do is, is shotgun, spread it out, run the ball that way. You've answered all my questions, Steve. Right now, I feel like I'm the host. Should I should I take us out or what? I mean, like I think we switched roles there for a second. Uh, that was that was cathartic. So thank you. I I I really enjoy just talking the things. So yeah, I I I think the Penn State should win this game big. It's just, are they going to get the big plays, Ryan? Like, do you trust Sean Clifford to throw the ball deep and somebody to catch it at this point? Um, well, it depends. Is it going to be a monsoon? I mean, I don't know. Like, I, mean, I, I know I keep coming back yeah. to the weather, but I just think it's, it's, a, it's an important, um, talking point this week. I mean, I, I, yeah. I look, I, I think the spread of 25 is really the right number. It's going to finish. Yeah. I really truly believe it could be 23 to 28, somewhere in that range. Uh, it would not surprise me if Northwestern covers. It would not surprise me if Penn State covers. I mean, I ha- I have I have to go towards Penn State because of yeah. what I've watched from Northwestern has been terrible. But I like I said, I've watched Penn State um, play down to their competition a lot. I mean, do I do I expect massive chunk big plays? Probably not. But I, I kind of look at this game as like a get in, get out. Let's get to our bye week, save yeah. our save our save our playbook, and you know, let's, let's get to the three games that really matter. So that that's, yeah. that's why I, there's part of me that thinks you, you play Northwestern just because it's a chunk, a lot of points and, and just get in, get out kind of game. But my God, Northwestern, it's just not, they're just not yeah. very good. So this is a hard one, man. To, yeah. this is, when you're talking about the spread, I think it's, it's harder than, than I think it, a lot let of me, fans will give it credit for. Let me give you a workaround on this one. If the Penn state backups make it into the game, 
this is going to, they're going to beat the spread because Drew Aller is a better deep passer. So they're, exactly. those are going to be there. So if Penn State and Nick Singleton can get them 21 points, get them 24 points, and then and then Drew Aller gets into the game, you know, I, I think the backups are going to score points. And then that's going to be the game. And And as long as the defense does what the defense does, they should be able to hold that. So you should be rooting to see Drew Aller in this game, as most Penn State fans have been anyway. So yeah, mm-hmm. there you go. It all lines up. That'll do it. You got anything else for us? That is it for me. Um, No games for me this weekend. I will be home watching college football and uh, enjoying it. It's it's going to be all rainy here tonight, so I'm not going to go out in uh, in for high school games this weekend. But uh, off to DC next weekend to watch a host of guys down there, and you know we'll we'll get into that next week. But it's just uh, looking forward to seeing how Penn State plays. Hey, actually, no one thing I should say: this is a really good week of college football. Like there are some there from twelve to 10 30 Saturday. Like there are marquee games through the whole calendar. So if you're not going to be for stadium this week, it's a pretty good week to hang out on your couch and watch football. Because I think there's, there's just like, like even like Michigan, Iowa, like at Iowa, like I yeah. know like, yeah, Michigan should rumble, but like Iowa just has that magic, right? Like that, that, that kinetic magic where like those games just stay close and they should be. You got Oklahoma state Baylor, which is a, another underrated game. You got Arkansas, Alabama. Like I know. Yeah. that Alabama should rumble, but like Arkansas is playing well. They should have beat AM yeah. the other week. So there's just a host of good games. Kentucky, I mean, Kentucky Ole Miss is a 12, 12 o'clock kickoff, two uh, top 15 teams. I mean, I don't know. I just think it's a, it's a great week for college football. This is, in my opinion, the best week of college football uh, that we've had so far. And I'm looking forward to, to enjoying it. Well, let's enjoy it. Let's get into the weekend. That'll do it for the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Card. That is Ryan Snyder. Subscribe to youtube and to our podcast download like rate review do all the checklist of things but most importantly just keep showing up you've been so awesome thank you for watching we'll be back with the live show post game for penn state northwestern talk to you then